So in this video, we're gonna look at gain staging and some good practices to create headroom. We should already know by now, all these tracks, audio and MIDI tracks and grouped tracks are all being routed by default through the master. Um, I'm gonna delete this. So there's nothing on the master right now. One thing to keep in mind is you wanna keep the master clean and green because otherwise you're going to be causing what's called digital distortion and if this meter turns red, then depending on what you're trying to do, that's most typically a bad thing. We don't necessarily want that to turn red. Over here in the other view in session view, if we look at this meter, I always keep this fader at zero because uh, some things I see early producers do is turn down the fader because it gets too loud or they see it clipping, but we always wanna leave that at zero and then turn down these individual tracks to be able to compensate for our headroom on the master. Typically before we enter the mastering stage, when a song is sent off to a mastering engineer to be finalized, we like to have minus three to minus six dB of headroom. That's usually a standard. Um, for the purpose of this, we're gonna talk about electronic dance music, which is usually produced a lot louder with compression, saturation, and all these different tools. But as we're adding effects, and as we're adding all these devices, such as like this drum bus on a group, we wanna be conscious of how much sound we're building up on each individual track that's also being routed through these groups, which essentially is all going to our master over here that like we were talking about. You can see this little meter. If I hit play, we'll see how loud it's getting. So let's see what that looks like. I'm gonna find the loudest part of the song, which is somewhere around here. And if I click this meter, it'll reset. So it looks like our loudest peak, yeah, it looks like our loudest peak is hitting around minus 2.7. If I wanted to pull down all the track volumes in unison so that I can adjust the volume on the master so that everything is still balanced where you had it, but the volume changes overall, it'll highlight, you can see all of the tracks across the board. And then now if I pull down the volume faders, it's gonna start pulling them down for me. So yeah, I'll click and highlight all of these tracks, pull them down, and then now if I hit play, we can see it's a little quieter. Now we're bouncing around minus nine or so. So I'm gonna start slowly turning these up. And you can see that we'll start to reach closer to that minus three to minus six. It's usually a happy place to stay with. We don't want this to turn red once again. Now, if you have automation on one of these faders, you're gonna break that automation, which is why I like to use automation on utility. This is a side note, but I use utility to do automation on the gain knob because for this purpose, we wanna be able to turn these faders up and down to control how much headroom we have over here on the master. So usually instead of automating volume um, on the fader, instead of automating the fader itself, use a utility and automate the gain instead so that you can do this. That's just a side tangent. Before we go any further, I want to let you know. This is totally optional. I don't always do this, but one thing you could do is turn all the faders down. So you can see now we don't have anything going and then just loop the loudest part of the song that you're working on and then start with the kick as the anchor. So let's set the kick somewhere to where it's hitting the master around minus 10. So I'll turn this up. And now the drum group, see this, this kick is running through this group. So I'll probably wanna set this group at zero so we can hear everything inside of it. So I'll reset the master. Yep, it's hitting around minus eight. That's pretty cool. Then I'll go to the snare, create that headroom to where I think the snare is starting to hit at a nice amount of loudness. Symbols. There we go. So now we kind of build up the drum group. Then typically I'll go to the bass. So the kick in dance music is the anchor of the song. That usually takes up a lot of headroom. That's got a lot of sonic, sonic energy. And any low frequency instruments are typically gonna take up the most amount of headroom and be the loudest part of the frequency spectrum when it comes to building up all the sound into your master. Think of this as if we were adding water in a cup, right? So there's only so much room in the cup to fill up water. The water would be each of these individual tracks and instruments that we're adding into the cup, the cup being our master. So basically start off with the kick, 
add all the drums around the kick, which is what we'd call like our anchor. Then we have our subs. So build up those subs around that and then um, go to say other lead instruments. Maybe it's your lead vocal, maybe it's like a lead synth or a pad or whatever. And usually, like I said, hitting somewhere around minus three to minus six gives you enough headroom on the master to really work with. And if the sound is too quiet, then just turn up your headphones on your audio interface or turn up your laptop speakers to make it a little bit louder if it gets too quiet. The other thing we need to look at is our gain staging on the inserts of the tracks themselves. So rather than just looking at the master and how much volume is going through our master, we need to be really conscious as we're stacking up more effects using such as Ableton's audio effects and other devices and instruments. We want to make sure that we're not clipping on the track level itself as well. So as we add devices and effects, there's these tiny little meters to the right of each effect showing you how much volume it's outputting. And we got to think about as we have signal flowing from the left to the right in these chains that we're building on the tracks, um, we want to be able to manipulate and sculpt the sounds without doing any kind of clipping or having some bad digital distortion. One common example for adding a bunch of distortion to this keyboard sound to give it some grit and I drive it really hard. Let's see what that sounds like. You can start to see it's starting to clip over here. You can hear it's got that weird bad crunch. Now some of these devices in Ableton Live and well, they'll have what's called a soft clip. Pretty popular for any kind of analog gear in the real world, like if you have an actual piece of hardware, they're a little more forgiving to be able to clip and, and smash and distort them because of the circuitry and the way they're designed. But when we're talking about in the digital world inside the box in a DAW, on a computer, it's it has to kind of replicate that process with real analog gear. So you might see something called soft clip. And if you're driving and distorting the input um, volume on a device or something, and it gets really loud and you start to see it clip, then turning on soft clip or turning down the output volume, because we're driving sound into the device, we also want to think about how much sound is coming out of the output as we're adding more distortion and flavor of whatever effect we're using. For this, it's saturator. So we have an output we can turn down. Same thing over here for the OTT. We have an output so we can start balancing our gain and looking at these meters and making sure we're not causing any kind of clipping on the output. Soft clip is really cool because it gives you the opportunity to drive and really smash and distort the sound if you're going for that kind of effect. And it also is more forgiving. It basically will cut off any of the clipping on the output so we can be a little more forgiving in how hard we're driving the sound. Now it does sound kind of similar, but it does make a, a subtle difference. So just being conscious of that, how hard you're driving stuff with the input signal and the output signal makes a big difference as we're building up and stacking effects. Something just to be really conscious of. And then also keeping in mind that as we do that, we also might be running something through a group. So for example, our drum group, we've got all these different tracks that we're compressing together with this drum bus, which is an Ableton audio effect. Uh, it's really great for treating a bunch of drums together. And so maybe we drive the input. We also have an output meter here. We can control how much output's going. And we have a trim. So the trim is the input signal. So if I turn that up, then you can see we can really clip and distort it, which is probably not what we're going for. So yeah, as you're blending sounds and mixing, um, how much headroom we have on the tracks, how much headroom we have on the master, and then our gain staging between these individual instruments. So hopefully you have a pretty solid idea of gain staging across your different tracks, building up headroom into your master. Right now I have nothing on the master. This is a great debate between some engineers and producers. I personally really like to have a limiter on my master. Once we get that minus three to minus six range on the master of headroom that we looked at earlier. So if I hit play, we might be hitting somewhere around there. Yep, we're at like minus seven-ish. Then the next thing I do is I would put a limiter on the master. We're gonna talk more about compression. Basically a limiter is a really powerful compressor. 
Um, down here in the audio effects folder in Ableton, you can see there is a limiter. Just gonna drag that onto the master track. And then what I do is now that we've got that good headroom, I'm actually gonna turn up the gain of all the tracks on the master together. And what the limiter is going to do is going to compress. It's going to push down the dynamic range between the quietest and the loudest parts of all these tracks. And I'm going to turn up the gain. It's going to compress that. It's going to squish them together and then turn up the output of the limiter. Yeah, basically it's squishing them, giving them a big group hug, and then it's turning up the output is what's happening with this limiter. It's giving us a good idea of when the song is actually finished later on and we send it to a mastering engineer to do all the final polishing of the song before it goes out into digital distribution like Spotify, iTunes, share it with your mom, your friends, whoever, then uh, we get a better idea of what it's going to sound like because a limiter is the last thing that is treated on the master in the mastering phase. So we get a good idea of how the dynamics, how all the tracks are going to play together just by hitting it with a limiter. And I usually do this as I'm producing and just keeping a good idea of keeping that headroom before hitting it with the limiter. So usually when I hit it with the limiter, I'm going to see it bounce between minus six and zero. I don't want to squash it too hard because I'll destroy the dynamic range of all the tracks being compressed together. But yeah, something like this. Yeah, zero to minus six. Yeah, it's a pretty solid amount of compression with the limiter. So yeah, hopefully this gives you an idea with the gain staging, starting to bring up the volume of your tracks, starting to create headroom on the individual tracks as we're mixing between these devices, making sure all the meters are clean and green. And yeah, you'll be well on your way to making some good sounding hot tracks. We'll talk more about compression in a later video, which has a big part to do with building up that gain staging and mixing in general.